Good morning. Glad you could join in today. Today we're going to jump back into our study in Colossians. And I'll invite you to open your Bible, which I'm sure you have handy, uh, to Colossians chapter 1. And uh, last time we were in Colossians, we finished up with verse 18. And in that area there, verses 16 to 18, Paul spent some time talking about the preeminence of Christ, his being the firstborn over all creation, not firstborn in terms of speaking of an order of being born per se, but rather of preeminence, of being the one who is, uh, well, I just, I love that word, preeminent over all things. Uh, he's the one, uh, like John would say in the beginning of his gospel in that prologue, that beautiful introduction to the person of Christ uh, by this apostle whom Jesus loved. The, uh, the fact that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and by him and without him, nothing was made that was made. The idea that through him, all things were made. He's preeminent over all things. Uh, if you've been following our podcast for any length of time, you know that we've spent a pretty significant amount of time and devoted an entire podcast to the idea of the deity of Christ. Uh, the fact that Jesus is not just a great teacher, not just a miracle worker, not somebody who came down the corridor of history and, and, uh, and taught some great things and did some amazing stuff that uh, that wowed people or something like this. He wasn't just somebody who was empowered by God, but just in himself was a mere man. No, Jesus is unique. He's the unique God-man, fully God, and in the incarnation became fully man. And the implication throughout the rest of the New Testament, including in the book of Revelation, is that there is now a man who is fully God sitting at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and so there is, um, uh, it's an important thing for us to understand simply theologically to understand, have a right understanding of the nature of God personally. But there's also another reason why Paul makes this case. And matter of fact, he goes on, we'll pick it up in verse 19 today, where he speaks of, uh, for, where he says in verse 19, for in him or in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Okay. Another uh, tremendous statement about Christ. In him, the fullness of God, all that is God was in him. Uh, in other words, he himself, as we've often said, uh, is fully God. Uh, this is something that Paul bears out many times throughout his writings. It's something that the apostles speak of in their writings. It's something the gospels portray. It's something that is uh, replete throughout the New Testament. And so, uh, as I was beginning to say, this is an important thing for us to understand as believers. But it was also, there's another reason why Paul wrote these things too. And that's because in the first century, there were other views that, had the, uh, that, that revolved around uh, an interpretation of Christ. These were, um, in particular, specifically, uh, there was a group called the Gnostics who believed, uh, who claimed to have a sort of a special knowledge uh, of spiritual things. And when it came to the person of Christ, they had a very different view of what, not only who Jesus was, but what Jesus was. And so a um, little bit of background on that. Uh, the, if you can call it a theology of, of Gnosticism revolved around the idea that, um, that matter was evil and that God was separate from matter and all this. So far we understand, okay, the idea that God is other, but they believed that from God emanated these, uh, this sort of creation began to emanate from, from God's will, and he began to desire to see creation come into being. Well, these emanations began to uh, ultimately emanate so far away from him that they became quite separate from him, quite detached from him, and they became evil. I'm being incredibly simplistic about this, but just for the sake of time. So by the time matter gets to uh, ultimately becomes what we see around us, uh, it is so separate from God that it is actually essentially evil. It is something that is um, far from God. It, it just it, it's no longer something uh, that that you would connect with Him in any way. And so, uh, and again, that's incredibly simplistic. But um, but when it came to the person of Christ, this becomes profound because the uh, the Gnostics believed that because matter was evil and because it it was so separate from God that the, the idea of God indwelling a human being, that God taking on in, in the incarnation, the idea that, that God would become a man was a completely abhorrent idea to them because that would be the equivalent of saying God was inhabiting something that was inherently evil. Uh, and so they would not uh, subscribe to the idea of the incarnation. They, they believed very opposite of that. 
And so Paul, and by the way, not just Paul, but even John, you know, when he talks about uh, he whom we have uh, seen with our eyes, heard with our ears, touched with our hands concerning the word of life, as he would say in the opening uh, verses of 1 John, um, you know, this was something that the apostles dealt with in that first century. Uh, and so um, the idea that Jesus uh, is in fact the fullness of God indwelt in, in, a, in a person is something that is key to Christian theology. Uh, and it's important for us to understand that this is, this is who and, and what and how Jesus is. Because if he were simply a spirit being, like the Gnostics would think, then there was no blood to shed. There was no uh, real atonement per se, because how, if you think that through, how could that actually work? Uh, but the fact that Jesus inhabited a physical body, uh, that he in fact was fully God and fully man, meant that he was, as a man, able to shed his blood for our sins. But as God, he himself was sinless and free from deserving the penalty of sin and free from any original sin that you and I would have. And so he's unique in this. And this is something that is, is part of what Paul is talking about. As a matter of fact, in the overall scope of Colossians, as we've often said along the way so far, God, uh, Paul is, uh, is portraying an exalted view of Jesus, a very high view of Jesus in the eyes of the Colossians there. And in this particular case, with the intent that they would be able to understand these things about Jesus in the light of the false doctrines that were floating around around them. Not only in terms of Gnosticism, but later on in the book, we'll see that he's also speaking against legalism and how Jesus is greater than any uh, obedience to the law could ever produce. Uh, faith in him is, is how we're ultimately saved as the one who took our sins to the cross and paid for them, having nailed them to the cross. And so in him dwells the fullness of God. God was pleased that the fullness of God would dwell within him. And through him, verse 20, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The practical element of what Jesus uh, came into the world to do was to reconcile. Uh, his uniqueness as both God and man afforded him not only the uh, not afforded him per se, but, but the reality of what he did and centers on who he is. Uh, if he came into the, uh, if, if he was just a man, then he would have no real ability to reconcile. But because he was fully God and fully man, this becomes the basis by which he's able to bring reconciliation. And by the way, not just uh, to, to people per se, but all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Uh, and so, um, uh, the scriptures tell us that the earth groans, the creation groans for its creator and such. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. You know, we, we read some of these passages in scriptures, like the trees clap their hands and, you know, all creation worships the Lord. Yeah, the passages that imply these ideas. And, you know, we, we think of trees and creation as being sort of inanimate per se, and it's not capable of of knowledge and relationship like you and I are. And that's that's true. I mean, trees don't have personalities per se, unless you're a Lord of the Rings fan, I guess. But, you know, really the idea that, uh, um, you know, the people are unique in that regard is something we understand. But nonetheless, creation naturally responds to its creator. Now, creation itself uh, listens to him and it responds to him and it obeys him. Uh, and it rejoices in him strangely. You know, we see again implications of this. Well, the idea of Jesus coming to the world to reconcile all things, in other words, to balance the ledger on all things. When the fall happened back in Genesis chapters, uh, we read about in ch chapter two and three and such, when the creation of man and ultimately uh, his and her fall, um, we, we see here that the world fundamentally changes. Uh, the world was one way prior to the fall and it became a fallen world after. Not just man, but the creation itself ultimately just is, becomes a different kind of a thing. It, it, it begins to degenerate and everything. Well, when Jesus ultimately and what he accomplished and what he will ultimately uh, bring to a crescendo is the, is, the, is the recreating of all things. You and I will have glorified bodies. We understand this from 1 Corinthians 15 and such. But even the earth itself, where we read about in Revelation, where there's a new heavens and a new earth, all of these things ultimately are redeemed and reconciled. It's, a, it's, it's an incredibly expansive, far-reaching kind of a thing. Um, all that is, that is 
separate from God right now, all that is alienated from God, all that has been pushed away from God because of the fall, will be brought back into its right place, into right relationship, and into the fullness of what it was supposed to be. And so there is a, a tremendous far-reaching element to the redemption. And, uh, and not only do we cry out uh, to ultimately become all that God had created us to be when we see him face to face, but even the creation groans in anticipation. And Jesus is the one, the unique one, who ultimately sets all things right. Obviously, we don't see it yet, so we know it's coming, but it is coming, and we can look forward to that with great anticipation. Um, in verse 21, or I'm, I'm going to finish in verse 20 here. Again, the means by this is that he made peace by the blood of his cross. Now, this is, this is where it's an important place for us to once again revisit the gospel. The idea that it is by his shed blood that he has made peace peace. And notice, he is reconciling all things to himself. He is the one who made peace. God is the great initiator, and that's an essential thing for us to remember. This is, the gospel does not center on us looking for God or seeking to be made right in his eyes. The gospel paints the picture of you and I as being rebels, of keeping God at a comfortable, safe distance where we basically sort of have our lives, but we include a little bit of God in there, whereas insofar as it's comfortable, that's not the gospel. The gospel means that we recognize that you and I are alienated from him. Paul will go on to speak about this, and we'll talk more about that next time. But Paul speaks about how we're alienated from God, and it's Jesus who ultimately makes peace. Well, what alienates us from him? Our sin. Uh, you and I are sinful at the core. Now, you may be listening to this saying, well, I'm not that bad of a person. Well, compared to me, you might not be very bad of a person. You might be an amazingly great person compared to me, but the bar is pretty low if you're using me as your standard. That's not the way it works. Um, you know, and although comfortable as it is, you know, we always like to say, as long as I'm better than Hitler or something, I'm probably doing pretty well. That's not the gospel. The good news is inextricably linked to some pretty bad news. The bad news is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that every one of us, uh, like Isaiah would say, like sheep have gone astray, each one of us seeking, going after our own way. Uh, but ultimately, Christ has become the recompense, has become the, the um, has paid the penalty for us all. And so the good news and the bad news go hand in hand. And I think it's important that we understand the bad news. The bad news is that we're hopelessly lost without him. Uh, no matter how good we might be, ultimately, we are all fallen in sin. Every wrong thought we have, not just the actions, but Jesus made clear that even our thoughts, if they are, uh, if they're askew, and they they often are, then we are guilty of sin. So there's really no escaping it. None of us has a clean slate. None of us can stand before God and said, "Well, I did it." It's impossible. As a matter of fact, um, Jesus Himself uh, in the garden asked the Father that there was any other way, ultimately for you know, for his redemptive plans to be fulfilled, then let's go that way. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. And so the, there was no answer from heaven. So clearly there was no other way. Paul, when he's writing in uh, to the Galatians says, you know, I don't set aside the grace of God for if, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died needlessly, Galatians chapter two. And so it becomes important for us to recognize that, to understand our actual true condition. Not to buy into the world's idea that you and I are good enough or that we deserve good things or that somehow we're worthy of, of, of whatever we feel we're worthy of. When it comes to being right before God, Isaiah was truly correct when he said, all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Um, you know, it's interesting that in the, new t in, uh, in the book of Revelation, it speaks of those who are redeemed as having white robes, white garments, like white, clean white, pure, uh, old garments being cast off and new garments being given, one that God gives. It's an interesting parallel between that and uh, the book of Genesis where they try to cover themselves after their fall, but God will have none of that. He ultimately goes and he gets a, a skin from an animal that obviously had to die. Blood was shed, setting a picture and a model for the redemptive purposes that would ultimately be fulfilled in Christ. But he takes this, this skin, this garment, as it will, as you will, and, and puts it on them. And this is how their shame is covered. 
Well, in the book of Revelation, there's another garment now given, one that is white and pure. Uh, and what does God say in Isaiah? You know, uh, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, yet I'll make them white as snow. And this ultimately is, is what we're talking about here. Our condition is one of being stained with sin, one that, that, uh, that is, is the cause of the, the bloodshed of sacrifices and offerings throughout the centuries in the Jewish system, uh, this, 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 this constant shame that we feel for our sin. And God help you if you don't feel shame over your sin. The Bible speaks about a conscience being seared with a hot iron. My prayer is that you're not in that condition. And if you're watching this, my hope is that the Holy Spirit is letting you know that these things are true and that you need to hear the gospel and be saved and your efforts won't cut it. The gospel is where Jesus' efforts cut it. Jesus' efforts are sufficient. Jesus' offering and sacrifice is sufficient. And you and I are saved by what he's finished and accomplished. It is he that, that came to make peace. It is God who so loved the world, not the world who so loved God, but God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, whoever would believe in him, the idea that you are willing to set aside your own pride, your own arrogance, your own sense of being able to pull yourself up and, and, and earn a right place in heaven based on your own efforts, or believing in anyone else or anything else, but solely in Christ, who himself said he's the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Coming to recognize our condition of being lost, completely and utterly lost, and incapable of saving ourselves, and recognizing that in that condition, God, out of his deep and abiding love, sent his Son into the world to be our, uh, John would say, propitiation, or that, 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 that one who would come and pay our debt. As a matter of fact, later in this same book uh, of Colossians that we're studying, in chapter 2, Paul will speak about <clears throat> how he took the handwriting of the transgressions that was against us, and he nailed it to the cross. The idea there is that of this list of sins and wrongs that we're guilty of, guilty as charged, but he took that debt that we owed society, or in this case, that we owed God, and he took it to the cross, and in his shed blood, he nailed it to the cross uh, in his body, as it were, as he went to the cross for our sakes. And ultimately, he dies for our sins. Three days later, he rose again. How's that possible? Well, he's God, and secondly, he had no sin of his own. He only had our sin that he took upon himself. So therefore, death could not hold him down. And it demonstrates not only that there's life beyond the grave, but that he alone is worthy, uh, ultimately, to pay the debt that you and I owed. And so there's great news. It's great joy in, being known, in knowing that we're set free from our sins because he paid for those things. It's he who made peace and reconciled us to himself. He's the great initiator. As, as Paul would say in Romans 5, 8, that, 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 that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And so rejoice in that. And if you're not a believer right now hearing these things, let me ask you, what on earth are you waiting for? What on earth is out there that's so great that, uh, that you're holding on to? What, what belief do you have that you think is somehow going to get you into heaven? Don't you know that Jesus came for you? He came for you, that you might be free and you might be forgiven and that you might live a life in anticipation of seeing him face to face and not having to be ashamed when you do. It's him we've offended, and he's the one who reached out to save us. Don't set that aside. Don't cast it off. Don't turn away, but rather come to him today. You know, we, we also, one of the things we talk about on this podcast a lot is prophecy, and we talk about end times. Um, and when we look at the conditions of the world around us, we realize that we're getting really, really close to the time when the things that are spoken of in places like Ezekiel 30 and 39, and then soon afterwards what's spoken of in Revelation chapters you know, 6 through 19 and that, are going to come to pass. And these are going to be really, really rough times leading up to the time when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom. But there is that understanding those things, knowing that we're getting that close, should bring a sense of urgency to you, should bring you to a place where you realize, I don't want to wait anymore. I don't want to goof around with this whole idea anymore. I want to know that I'm right with God and I want to take whatever time is left and I want him to use me for his purposes. I want to walk with him and I want to know him and I want him to live his purposes and plans out through my life. Um, any believer who's watching this right now, this is, this is what we have 
uh, have, have, have chosen. This is what we have uh, tied on with. This is what we believe. And we're inviting you, and most importantly, the Holy Spirit is inviting you to put your trust in Christ that you might join the family of God and that you would, in the rest of your days, walk with him and get to know him all the better in the anticipation of seeing him and that he might use you in the days ahead. So I'm gonna invite you to pray with me as we close for today and tomorrow or the next time we come into Colossians, we'll pick it up here. But I'm gonna invite you to pray with me right now. And as I pray, there's gonna be a point where you can join in to receive Christ yourself as your own personal Lord and Savior. This is a moment of decision for you and I'm inviting you to make that decision, the right one, to put your trust in Christ alone. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that in your word we find not only instruction, but wonderful invitation. We see so much that reveals about your, uh, that tells us about your nature and, and you've revealed yourself to us in it. We thank you that you've told us things in advance that are going to come. You've explained to us our condition and as heart-wrenching as it is to realize what our condition truly is, it only makes the beauty of the good news shine all the more brightly and become all the more attractive. Uh, and, and, and Father, I just thank you, Lord, for, <clears throat> for, those, uh, for myself and any who have already come to believe in the finished work of Christ, in your great love for us being accomplished in drawing us close through Jesus paying our debt. And Father, for those who are watching right now or listening that have never come to that place of, of receiving Jesus themselves, of recognizing their need, their desperate need for him, and laying down their their arms, as it were, putting up the white flag and surrendering. Uh, Father, I pray that this would be the moment that they no longer put it off, but that today would be the day where they come to faith. They put their trust in you and are saved. If that's you, then I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I have broken your law. I have violated it. I have kept you at arm's length. I have walked in my own ways, and my own righteousness really is like filthy rags. I realize that now, and I also realize that I can't save myself. But I do believe that Jesus came and died on the cross to pay for all of my sins, past, present, and future, and that having died for them and rose again on the third day, he has set me free and has paid my debt. I thank you for your forgiveness and your love for me, and I thank you for sending your son to pay for my sins once and for all. And with the time that I have left, I pray that you would help me to follow you, to walk in your ways, to set aside the old things that kept me from you, and instead to give you full reign in my life, not only as my Savior, but as my Lord. I love you and I thank you for first loving me and saving me. And I look forward to seeing you face to face, forgiven and unashamed. Thank you for washing me clean. In Jesus' name, amen. It's really what it's about is being washed clean. And one day you'll get to see him face to face. You won't have to be afraid. He won't be judged anymore because your judgment fell upon Jesus and he paid for that. And so welcome to the family of God. And as we often say at the end of our podcast, uh, especially if you're new to this, you may not know this, but we like for you to comment. Certainly, if you prayed to receive Christ, I'd love to hear from you uh, that I can maybe help you find a good local church that believes the word of God is the word of God. They'll teach it to you so that you'll know what God has to say and that you'll grow alongside of other believers as they grow in their faith too. Um, if you're in anywhere around Franklin, Tennessee, come on out and visit us. And, uh, and uh, we'd love to have you come and spend time uh, growing in your faith alongside of us as well. And uh, you can also, uh, as well as comment below here on the video, you can also email me at uh, our church website at calvarychapelfranklin.com. Uh, you can learn about our church there. You can learn about our service times and such. Sometimes, like this weekend, we're going to be doing a potluck. Uh, at one of our uh, our folks' property, so we won't actually be at our church building. So, website's a good way to find out what's going on. But um, we encourage you to watch this podcast uh, as we go through the Word of God and we talk about other discipleship-based kinds of things. Um, you can also go to my personal website at parsonspad.com, and you can subscribe to the podcast, whether it's video or audio, there. 
and uh, and you can comment and email me from there as well. And I'd love to hear from you. And uh, and certainly my hope is that through these podcasts or through our interactions, that you'd come to know Jesus better and you'd be able to just grow in your faith, walking with him until one day we see him. So God bless you and thanks for watching and hope to catch up with you again next time. And until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.